so Brad, this is a this is a really interesting book, and it has a grand narrative to it, and it takes us from 1870 up to to um, the 21st century. What's your what's the thesis? What's your the long 20th century? What's your point about it? Well, you know that history fundamentally changes around 1870, right? That before 1870, you know, there's technologies not far enough advanced for there to plausibly be enough for everyone. So history is mostly some elite figuring out how to elbow other elites out of the way and then how to run a force and fraud game on the rest of society um, to grab enough for themselves and in the process create the civilization's high culture, whatever it is. And in 1870, that changes. In 1870, technological progress achieves critical mass. And thereafter, humanity's technological prowess you know, doubles every generation, our ability to manipulate nature and organizing ourselves. Um, that means a truly human world, right? One that solves the problem of baking a sufficiently large economic pie so everyone could potentially have enough um, that that problem is being solved. And after that, well, most people in most centuries beforehand would have said that after you solve the problem of baking a large enough economic pie, you know, the problems of slicing and tasting it, of equitably distributing and properly utilizing our wealth, you know, should be easy peasy to deal with. Um, but they have not been, that even though the problem of baking a sufficiently large economic pie is one we have been solving at a fantastic rate since 1870, um, slicing and tasting, distributing and utilizing our wealth to enable us all to live lives wisely and well, that continues to elude us. Uh, so, you know, and that is the big story of 1870 to 2010, and that's the story I tell. So in some ways, this is a this is only partially the case I'm, from what you've just said. I do acknowledge that. There is a triumph of capitalism story here a bit, isn't there? That if you were very poor yes. in a developing country in 1850, you're likely to be much richer in the same developing country in 1950 and 2010. That yes. There is a triumph that capitalism, for its flaws, and you get to yes. the flaws towards the end, improve the lives yes. of yes. most yes. people to a certain extent. Yes, that only 500 billion people now, only one sixteenth of our population, live at the $3 a day that was kind of the rule for 70% of the population in 1870 and before. And, you know, to move the number of people living at $3 a day from, you know, 70% um, of the population down to 5% of the population is an enormous achievement. On the other hand, that it's still, you know, 5% is a scandal and a disgrace to us. Not to mention the fact that I live in one of the richest neighborhoods some um, in the world, right? A mile south of the UC Berkeley campus, a mile south north of the Rock Ridge BART in the technological prosperous hub of the world, San Francisco Bay Area. And half a mile away from me, there's a man living in a box. And all the technology in the world hasn't managed to, to, to solve that problem. Yeah, or rather it's a different problem. It's it's not a problem of creating more powerful forces of production hardware, but rather of writing the proper you know, economic, sociological, social institutions code to run on top of that hardware, to enable us to distribute and enable us all to live lives wisely and well. Well, let's get to that, 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 that again at the end, because it's, where we are now is so important. But what were the technological changes? What were the shifts that you see in the first half of your story that managed to, to, to move the dial so significantly? Well, you know, every economic historian you know, has a favorite thing that really mattered the most. Right? There are bunches of people who say it was the glorious revolution of 1688-89 in England that established constitutional government and limited, limited monarchy. There are others who say it was the scientific revolution and the coming of the habit of empirical inquiry that underlies science. That ideas are judged primarily by whether they're true or not, you know, not whether they're convenient to the elite that's running its force and fraud game on the rest of society. And, you know, I want to be agnostic. I want to say that what really mattered was everything coming together. And the last three pieces of the institutions that fall into place, right, um, they're the coming of the Industrial Research Lab, which rationalizes and routinizes the discovery and development of technologies. 
there's the coming of the modern corporation, which takes the products of the research lab and then develops and can deploy them worldwide. You know, once you have one factory built for a corporation, it's easy to duplicate it. All this in the context of globalization of the global market economy that provides enormous financial incentives to people to actually take these technologies and then deploy them and then for others to copy them. And so they can then diffuse throughout the world economy. And with those three things all falling into place around 1870, all of a sudden the rate of technological progress worldwide more than quadruples. And it goes from a world in which your life is kind of a lot like your grandmother's in material things and how you live it, to one in which you know, each generation is twice as wealthy as the previous one with a not just immense wealth being created, but a substantial number of industries, occupations, livelihoods, and communities being made obsolete and thrown onto the social garbage heap every generation as well. In, in that sense of your story, big world events like the World Wars or in the Cold War, uh, I suppose, as mm -hmm. well, uh, can we see them as agents of change, that they, they, they um, had an impact on things like uh, female equality, the First World War, the Second World War, mass industrialization, yes. technology, yes. leaving aside the human tragedy of them? Is this, is this your thing, an argument here that there's a sort of human tragedy when you talk about war, but there's also a kind of technological advance? Yes. Well, there is a powerful technological advance from wars because they focus government's attention on improving technologies for spotting where people are and then blowing them up. Um, and those technologies have lots of implications and side uses for other technologies as well. You know, they're, um, you know, robotic sensing and deployment technologies. They are, they can be deployed in the killer robots now, you know, um, stalking people from above and the skies above Ukraine, but they are going to have lots of other more productive, more peaceful, more useful um, uses in the future. So it's an intensification, definitely, um, especially the Cold War, during which we actually didn't blow things up, but instead got a lot better at making a huge number of things. Um, but the underlying dynamic is still there, even in times of relative peace and times of non-arms race. Um, <clears throat> it is really there starting in 1870 with this doubling of human technological prowess every generation. So there is a narrative that, um, you know, this is a, a slightly misquoted, but they're kind of the end of history narrative that we we, we get through most yeah. of the 20th century and it's all going well. The, the Berlin Wall comes down. Mm -hmm. There is a general mm -hmm. consensus, mm -hmm. a cuddly consensus that actually a sort yeah. of liberal way of living is more or less becoming accepted the yeah. world over. And we're getting there. We're getting to the end of the historical point yeah. and it's all going terribly well. And if we look around today, yeah. and if that I, didn't happen. Yes. And if I'd actually written the book back in 1998, when I first went from thinking someone should write this book to maybe I should write this book, and actually wrote a draft chapter two, um, which I then gave as a talk at um, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, I believe, if I'd actually written the book then, it would very much have been a Frank Fukuyama end of history, yay, yay, you know, liberal capitalist democracy, triumphant. We've solved, we're rapidly solving the problem of making the sufficiently large economic pie. And look, lo and behold, we're solving the problems of slicing and tasting it too. We are starting to figure out how to equitably distribute our wealth, both worldwide and within countries. And we're also figuring out how to use our wealth to, for human flourishing, to make us all safe, secure, healthy, and happy, you know, to live our lives wisely and well. But then a lot more history happened since. And now you can't be so optimistic. Um, you got to say that, yes, we're solving the problems of baking the pie, but the problems of slicing and properly tasting it are still flummoxes. And what, what are the reasons? What, what, what's the history that piled in? Is climate change a big historical existence that wasn't really foreseen properly in, in the, the, the 90s? Is it the rise of China? It wasn't. It it wasn't. It's a, that's a utilization thing. Um I actually think the history of the 20th century, which is the point during which we're solving the problem of baking a pie and thinking we're about to solve the others, that really comes to an end around 2010. Um, first, as global warming comes to the fore, as a first order civilizational problem that so far we're completely inept at dealing with. 
And we're seeing the first hugely catastrophic signs of its effects right now this year, as the monsoon is 200 miles south of where it should be normally. And there are 3 billion people whose lives, the fabric of their lives depends on the monsoon being in the right place at the right time in the right intensity in Asia. And it ain't there this year. Um, but yes, you know, the feeling that liberal democracy now faces a potential challenge um, from an alternative regime, which somebody or other called a shotgun marriage of von, von Hayek's economy to Lenin's polity, um, all blessed by Master Kung's ideas of governmental responsibility, the fact that we may well not have, um, that we may well not have it um, right in terms of institutions. You know, the slowing down of the engine of growth in the industrial core from something like 2% a year to 1% a year after 2007, the engine of growth not firing on all cylinders, which means that the destruction part of Schumpeterian creative destruction is not offset by as big benefits. Um, the United States ceasing to be any kind of example to the rest of the world as a whole as to what the possibilities for the future might hold. Um, and also stopping being a kind of, at least thinking it's a benevolent conductor of a peaceful international orchestra, but instead becoming a chaos monkey um, in various ways. Is that the, is that, all of those is, things is that, seem to make, sorry, Brad, is that the Trump phenomenon? You, you talk about this in, in, in the book. Well, except it was earlier, except it was earlier as well, right? That George H.W. Bush and his staff, I think quite wisely at the end of the Cold War, said, well, gee, the Cold War is over. What do we do forward? Well, we have this powerful U.S. military. Um, it's at the service of the Security Council, right? So unless you think you're going to get all members of the Security Council, all of the Security Council's veto powers really angry at you, you don't need to worry um, about the possibility of a major war at all. So no one needs to waste much money on weapons going forward. And, you know, that was, I think, a very wise decision by George H.W. Bush. And if it had stuck, I think we would be in a peaceful and a better world because we wouldn't be spending so much money worldwide on forces of destruction. You know, but his son, George W. Bush, decided to take that, you know, architect, that wor architecture of the world, of a peaceful world or demilitarized world order and smash it to bits in 2003. And lo and behold, here we are. Yeah, although there's an argument, um, I suppose, that people like Putin... Have always existed in the world, and if 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 have always existed. But if the West demilitarizes it yes. to that extent, then Putin may have seen it seized an opportunity in the way that he has done. I mean, ultimately, he's gone after Ukraine because we said to Ukraine, yes. "Don't have nuclear weapons; uh, mm -hmm. we'll look after you." And that and eventually offered, yes. offered an opportunity to Putin, didn't it? Yep, 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 yep. You know, you can be sure that after the. You know, if the invasion of Iraq in 2003 didn't teach, didn't teach you, the invasion of Ukraine in 2022 will teach you that you're probably safer with nuclear weapons than without. You know, that the old argument that nuclear weapons are more trouble than you're worth, because if you have them, then one of your god mad, one of your colonels might be maddened by God maddened and think God will protect your country and launch them at somebody else. Um, and that that's, the major risk of having nuclear weapons and you don't want that risk, so much better not to have them. That was a very good argument back when George H.W. Bush and company made it in the, in the early 1990s. That doesn't look like such a good argument today. Um, is there an argument in your book, Brad, here, that in what you're saying that technology was, with rough corners, broadly a good thing for a hundred odd years? It was making a difference. It was expanding um, capitalism. It was expanding uh, an ability to grow the economy all over the world. It was connecting us all up. Globalization took mm -hmm. place. That was broadly a rising tide that floated all boats. That's a really good thing. Right. Are we now living in a world where mm -hmm. actually those forces of technology have become pernicious? They've become divisive. They've not necessarily increasing our productivity. They might be increasing our misery. Is that is that too kind of Luddite an argument, do you think? Well, I, I still think it is, if only because I think that the only way we're going to support 8 billion people at a reasonable standard of living without cooking the planet is if we have further technological advances, you know, which are ongoing right now, to actually deploy renewables so that we're powering our civilization by the sunlight that's hitting the earth now. 
rather than by the sunlight that hit the earth 500 million years ago and grew plants that turned into coal that got buried that turned into coal and then the glaciers scraped the rock off above the coal so we could grab it etc cetera, etc cetera. that you know the future of our civilization or any civilization or at least at anything like the current level of world population does require much additional technological advance um you know, technology is our power to manipulate nature and organize ourselves. And you, know, you look around, and yes, we have marvelous technologies. You look around, we also have major problems of distribution. You know, that back in 1870, as I said, three quarters of the human race spent a lot of time thinking about how hungry it was. And now we're down to, as I say, 5% or so. That's a huge um, plus. Um, back in 1870, half your babies would die before five, and now they don't. Your worldwide life expectancy is about 70, and that's a huge plus. But still, we have killer robots stalking the skies above Ukraine, and south of Market Street in San Francisco, some of the most talented brains in the world spend their days figuring out how to scare, how to terrify old people to keep their eyeballs glued to screens so they can be sold fake diabetes cures and crypto grifts. Um, that problems of distribution and utilization, problems of slicing and tasting still completely flummox us and appear to flummox us more. Um, do they flummox us more? That's an interesting It was actually do, running. Do they flummox us more? Because yeah, it, I do. I do. Because I, I, if we had this conversation in the 70s or the 50s or the 20s, there would be still rich people trying to screw poorer people. There would still be the yeah. flummoxing power yeah. that existed yeah. out there. I mean, actually, yeah. is it dramatically worse now? I think that it, well, I don't know. I'm, I oscillate back and forth on this. I would say that up until, you know, um, up until maybe sometime in the past 20 years, or maybe it's just that as you get older, you start to wake up with more aches and pains and you become a more pessimistic and dour person. I'm not sure that there was optimism, that there was saying that there was that back in 1870, um, not only was there no possibility that you could bake a sufficiently large economic pie for people to have enough, but also that the primary thing of the primary form of governance was we run a force and fraud game to steal from the rest so we and our families can have enough. And, you know, my particular coalition of thugs with spears, with tame, you know, accountants, bureaucrats and propagandists attached to it, tries to elbow some other one out of the way. That as Tim Noah said, reviewing my book, I think the day before yesterday in the New Republic, that when Proudhon in 1840 wrote that property was theft, it wasn't a metaphor. It really was a metaphor. It's taking stuff others have made and making it your own. It's not in some sense being lucky and contributing to a creation process and grabbing an extra share. So there was a feeling that that was all dying away as it was no longer necessary as we became richer. Um, yet now, um, we seem to be using lots of our technologies for evil, either in the form of brainwashing people so you can make them miserable so you can sell them ads, or in the form of the killer robot stalking the skies. I mean, the first person I think who, or I've read recently who really saw this, you know, was Winston Churchill writing after World War I about World War I precisely about how humanity's powers for creation and destruction had been vastly increased. That on the one hand, a much more prosperous world in 1913 than anyone had thought possible in 1870. On the other hand, a war that was much more destructive and devastating and horrible than anyone had possibly conceived could possibly occur. And that which of those would dominate you know, hung in the balance and was our choice ultimately. And, you know, that made me think somewhat more highly of Winston Churchill. And that's still the case now. Just before you go, uh, he saw that. before you go, Brad, um, so where are, where are we on the optimism-pessimism scale then? That uh, Do you feel that we've reached the end of the long 20th century, that by the end was a moment of opportunity, which may well have been squandered, but we still have this great technology, we still have these moments of, of reflection. How optimistic can you be that we start sorting things out? Well, you know, and we have 8 billion of us. Um, and, you know, we are, 
I don't know. It's it's playing who human beings are is, you know, a con game of one sort or another. You take whatever you want to be and you claim this is the essential characteristic of humans. But let me play that game. Let me say that, you know, um, baboons organize themselves and keep the band together by picking, you know, fleas and lice and ticks off of each other um, in order to make each other happy and less parasite ridden. And you, you grew my back, I grew yours, we're friends. And so we share food and so forth. So with humans, it's we form gift exchange relationships. You know, one in which each tries to outdo the other with giving them things of value and it's clearly reciprocal and it, you know, it makes us all friends. And we start out with this is just how we associate in groups of 20 or so. You know, but now there are 8 billion people um, in the world, any of whom can set up a Patreon, say, and ask for money for funds for support from anyone else. And everyone else can see what's going wrong with their life and be willing to say, hey, I should contribute you know, some social power, some control over resources to them to make their life easier. And that creates an enormous worldwide web of people who have common mutual concern. And as long as we can view um, all the other 8 billion of us as our brothers and sisters, rather than think that some of them are grifters um, or thugs um, out you know, to kill us and take our stuff, we should do very, very well because there are 8 billion of us. And while each of us is kind of just a jumped up monkey that whose brain is barely able to remember where you left your keys, um, together with all 8 billion of us talking and correcting with each other, we are an enormously intelligent anth an anthology intelligence. We should be able to do great things. Not so good. The, 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 I suppose the problem, Brad, is that some, some of them are grifters and thugs in the 8 billion. Well, yes, um, there is that. <laughs> Um, but that was an optimistic way to leave it. So I, don't, I think I, I, let, let, let me not yes. let me not ruin that moment uh, at all. Brad, great, fascinating stuff. These are huge great. ideas to wrestle with. Thank you so much for taking the Thank time you to very talk much. to us. It's been my great, great pleasure.